Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MedTech Impact Podcast, where you get to hear from leaders and innovators shaping the future of medical technology. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikuljong. And we're your hosts of the show. So on today's episode, we're delighted to be joined by Ben Friedman, co-founder of Limex Biosciences. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Ben, you were part of uh, Impact previously. It was a year ago now, so we're delighted to have this chance to catch up with you. As always, when we start our conversation, we like to frame it for the audience. So please tell us, what is the big problem that you're looking to solve? Well, thanks again for, for having us on, on the show today and really enjoyed being part of your Impact MTD2 cohort last, last fall. Um, so at Limax, we are trying to essentially recreate nature's toughest glue to revolutionize treatments for injuries inside and outside the body. It's really a platform technology, and we're trying to leverage its enormous potential to solve some of medicine's longest standing unmet clinical needs. Some of our lead indications right now are to solve unmet needs in advanced bleeding, um, which is really part of a $7 billion industry. I think when we talked about it last um, during the cohort, as you may recall, that uh, really despite advances in surgical glues and hemostatic patches, about 30% of surgeries still suffer from bleeding related complications. And these can be super devastating to patients um, and their families, resulting in extended surgical times, prolonged healing, and the need for blood transfusions, et cetera. So at LeanMax, we're really trying to address some of these pressing unmet needs with our, our hydrogels. So a big problem, uh, are you targeting any specific procedures when you're thinking about this problem? Yeah, that's a great question. So the technology can address a lot of different types of procedures, ranging from uh, procedures involving you know solid organs um, like livers and spleens um, to some larger vessels like aorta um, and beyond. I mean, those are just some of the internal applications um, that we think we can target with the technology. There's of course other topical applications that involve bleeding as well, where we think the materials can have significant impact. And in terms of the patient outcomes, obviously, you know, as you mentioned, there's excessive bleeding which you're trying to solve. What does that look like in terms of the outcomes for those patients currently when they have that failed solution? You know, cur currently um, the existing devices that are in place can result in, uh, you know, excessive bleeding, complicating surgery and requiring the need for blood transfusions and additional products. So this can have high uh, probabilities for requiring transfusions, requiring additional blood products to be brought in and high amounts of blood that, that can be lost. So the existing devices are usually these weakly adherent hemostatic patches, uh, basically advanced gauze sponges, or there are other types of technologies such as liquid-based hemostats. And they're really all confronted with one major challenge, which is poor adhesion to underlying tissue surfaces. And this often requires constant compression and really the hope that no complications arise after closure. You know, I think, Ben, that we've teased the audience enough here. Tell us more about your solution and exactly what it is and how does it work? Yeah, so you may have noticed that Limax is Latin for slug. And we've taken inspiration from really nature's toughest glue, which you may already know is slug slime. And essentially, we you know don't use any slug components in our materials, but we try to create hydrogels that behave in a similar way. So the materials that we've developed have extremely high mechanical toughness and stretchability, and this enables us to have strong adhesion to underlying tissue surfaces. Materials that we've developed are about 90% water. They have stretchability more than 20 times their initial length. And this combination enables us to attach to surfaces, whether they're wet or bloody or moving, really better than anything else that exists commercially. We're about um, 100 to 1,000 times stronger than any existing uh, commercial product. And we think that this is going to enable really transformative uh, potential for these materials to improve patient outcomes. Oh, that's fantastic. And you know, I, I really appreciate you kind of hitting there on the unique benefits of your product and how it's better than maybe other products that are out there today on the market. You know, I didn't know what Lee Max meant in Latin, that's for sure. <laughs> so you might be a little bit smarter than the average person in the audience here. How did you kind of make that comparison? How did you le leverage nature to inspire the development and creation of your technology? And I guess, how did you just discover this solution in general? What, what led you to discovering that? Is it called hydrogel? Is that it? Hydrogel, exactly. Okay. You know, this has been a long time coming. This is a project that, you know, started um, well before I started my postdoc at Harvard and the Beast Institute, you know, back in 2012, when there was a discovery made 
uh, by two labs at Harvard, both uh, David Mooney's lab and Ji Gong Suo's lab, that invented a material which they termed tough hydrogel that had unique mechanical properties. Previously, hydrogels that have been developed typically have weak and brittle properties. You can't really stretch them very much. They'll pretty much just shatter. And they basically, at the time, discovered a hydrogel that performed more like a rubber band when you start to pull it in tension, but the materials are basically 90% water. And at the time, the material had really unique properties, but it really wasn't clear what the, the killer biomedical application would be of that gel. And then in around the 2017 timeframe, uh, there was a big effort that was going on in the lab to develop bioadhesives. And this was um, something that was, uh, you know, taking some inspiration from, from nature. There's, of course, been a lot of work, you know, historically uh, looking at nature for inspiration, whether that be muscle-inspired adhesives, et cetera. But those are typically very rigid, and they don't really solve the underlying problem of these materials basically still not attaching strongly. Um, and actually, when you look at a lot of these existing adhesives, they all basically fail cohesively. The matrix that makes up that material fails, and that what's, that's what limits the adhesion, because all the efforts focused on understanding the chemical bonds that generate adhesion properties. But when we look at nature, we look at some creatures like the slug, where, you know, where slug slime is a hydrogel. It's 90%, 95% water. It's supposed to have a dual polymer network of ions, proteins, and sugars that give it extraordinary mechanical strength. You can stretch slug slime 10 to 15 times its length, and it contains a number of uh, different proteins, including those that contain positively charged amines. So when we kind of look at this base stretchable hydrogel that we had already in the lab with slug slime, we said, well, you know, what can we do to this to try to make it behave more similar to, to the slug? And the answer for that was to think about coupling that gel to tissues by integrating a liquid-based, what we call a bridging polymer, basically a, a, another network that we can apply over the sur surface of that gel. So the past, you know, number of years since we made this initial discovery, um, it was, you know, really eye-opening uh, when we could take this material um, with the same base characteristics and start to apply to tissues all over the body. Um, some of the earliest examples of the technology were attaching it to the surface of a bloody and beating pig heart, where, um, you know, if you see some of the videos on YouTube that are, are floating around, you can see this uh, material um, really attached and conform incredibly well to the surface of a dynamically moving organ. Um, the materials were then applied to other types of tissues, whether that be liver or spleen tissues, bleeding environments, where they can still uh, maintain their strong stretchability and adhesion to these underlying surfaces. And we started then exploring other areas as well. Uh, my PhD is in orthopedic biomechanics, so I had a natural in interest in tendon and ligament. Um, so we started doing some studies, uh, attaching them to the surfaces of tendon and ligaments, um, again, showing really impressive adhesion properties. And we began you know, thinking about developing next generation versions of these materials, those that could degrade, those that could be loaded with different types of therapeutics to enable local drug delivery. Um, and as we did this, we started expanding you know, our clinical outreach, talking to more and more clinicians at different conferences. You know, during the pandemic, when things started to shut down, we applied for an NSF I-4 grant. And you know, we, we were excited to get the, that, that grant, which really enabled us to push a lot of different types of customer discovery and outreach. Uh, during that time when, when things were shut down, we were doing quite a bit of, of outreach in different, in different areas. And then when things started to open up again, we started going and traveling around to many different conferences throughout the country, uh, spanning a lot of different clinical specialties. So um, from that, it's been really exciting to take this kind of from the early phase to uh, being able to explore different, multiple different types of clinical indications and get those key opinion leaders on board with, with uh, what we're doing. Nice. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that with us. And I never thought I'd be so fascinated by slug slime. Uh, so this is... <laughs> This is really cool. Well, you know, when you talk about vascular neurosurgery, wound care, I mean, three areas of medical device in the, in the healthcare industry that's obviously really taking off. There's a lot of innovation, a lot of focus in those areas. We see a lot of really strong growth in those areas. So, you know, it sounds like your technology is going to complement a lot of kind of what's going on and how they're improving technologies and outcomes in those areas. Um, really cool. And, and I guess when you think about, Richard, that go-to-market strategy in those three areas, it's something that I think we're always really interested and fascinated to learn more about. Yeah, and Kyle, you're, you were thinking exactly the same as me. This is such an interesting approach in terms of you've taken this exploration of the natural environment and now you're translating that. And I love the fact that you, you mentioned the iCore program, which we're obviously a huge advocates of, and you've gone through that translatory process of getting the feedback from the care professionals. And I wonder now if you could talk a little bit about that go-to-market strategy in terms of 
what that feedback has been like and how that's informed the next process of development? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So, uh, you know, we, I think we talked about, the, you know, the, a lot of the platform of appeal for these materials um, for both internal applications and topical applications. And as a result, those have different opportunities for how, how we may roll out products in that space and the timeline for, for uh, prioritizing different indications. Because these different areas have uh, different regulatory pathways, this really builds into our go-to market strategy where we're trying to roll out opportunities both for topical as well as internal applications. The topical um, will likely come first as class two products versus the internal applications, which are regulated as class three PMAs. And as those go through the approval processes, we'll, they'll be staggered. The topicals, you know, we hope will enable us to have earlier revenue streams while we wrap up the pivotal human clinical trials for the PMA. And together, these will enable us to have really enormous impact, both uh, for external injuries as well as injuries inside the body. And so potentially two very different channels to market there in terms of if you're using a class three type product, which is going to be used in the hospital and surgical setting versus a topical product, which may have multiple different channels that you could tap into. What's the mindset and thinking around that first beachhead market of something that's potentially less risky, but easier to get to market? Yeah, it's a big discussion area that we, that we bat around quite a bit. You know, certainly there's interest clinically in, in both areas, uh, but being able to get a product that's out there that's, you know, maybe has lower uh, regulatory risk profile that we can start to demonstrate safety efficacy in patients, you know, will we'll definitely go a long way with further de-risking the internal application as that is definitely, you know, a little bit longer time to, to market. You touched on there, the regulatory, and I'm sure Kyle, the audience is keen to know more about what that looks like. Yeah, you know, it, it is. It's really interesting because I, I didn't, you know, when you, yeah, when you think about outside the body, inside of the body, class two, class three, PMA, I would imagine the outside of the body, 510K, there must be a, is there a predicate kind of device that you're working off of? Exactly, exactly. So, so you know, that, that, that's the benefit of, of that path that you can identify the predicate. The path is, is relatively well defined, even for the internal application, it's rel relatively well defined as well, unless you start going after a brand new indication. But that does require the longer term pivotal trials, the more expanded GLP animal studies, etc. Sorry to interrupt. Is that more focused though on the wound care side of the business? Is that the market that you're really targeting first here? Yeah, there's a lot of op applications for, for topical, which involves which involves wound care. Yes. And would that be a prescribed by a doctor or could it potentially be an over-the-counter solution? Yeah, great question. Um, we, we, we think there's, a, of course, a lot of opportunity for prescription-based, but also, you know, complete over-the-counter use. So hoping that we can be able to leverage both sales channels and opportunities for, for the technology. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your work, at least on the internal applications with the pig's heart. And uh, so those videos that we can uh, go check out after the show. Um, but I guess, what does it take from a regulatory pathway to what you're going after the class two topical type of um, treatment? Yeah, so, so the, the so, so for the topical, you know, this is just the standard, you know, battery invention performance tests, you know, depending on the exact indication space, sometimes these can involve a, a large animal trial for you know, some safety and efficacy. And then, you know, most of the time they, these don't involve human clinical trials for approval. Usually there's a post-market uh, human clinical trial, which will be needed, but not necessarily for FDA approval. Okay. That's pretty neat. Then are you, would you say you're pretty close? I mean, to uh 510k approval then? Can you disclose that? <laughs> I don't think we can disclose that yet, but I, um, I, I think there's a lot of exciting things that we're doing. And hopefully uh, this is uh, something that we can get out to um, patients and, and providers soon. Yeah, usually we ask, you know, what are the doctors and physicians saying about your technology, but, and I don't know how, how they are, might be involved, you know, but I guess, what do the results so far look like in the type of classic verification validation type of work to, you know, prove that the product, it, it works the way it's intended to? Yeah, so you know we we've been you know really continuously publishing this work and the positive results from from the beginning. Um, I think to date there's over twelve papers now that have been uh, published in some premier journals like Nature Science, Nature BME, Advanced Materials, and others that have really highlighted the the key performance of the of the materials across you know a number of different indications, both the topical areas that we're talking about as well as some other internal areas. And there's a lot of new things that we're working on that are currently under review. You know, those studies will be hopefully accepted soon um, and we'll be able to share them with you through uh, through MTD2 and the impact program. That's neat. Yeah. And I mean, with all of these efforts come challenges, which we all know of, right? 
Um, oh and- yeah, and we were just <laughs> talking a little bit before. I mean, a year ago when Ben was doing the program, I mean, you, you had a newborn and you've been doing your own research at the same time, and and you're running a startup. So you know, take your pick. What's been the biggest challenge? You know that you know with all these challenges comes opportunities. So I, I think yeah, there's there's challenges across the board. Um, whether that be you know building a team, science, regulatory strategy, thinking about all these key areas of go to market, raising a baby. You know, all all these things are exciting challenges, but they present some really awesome opportunities. So I'm not sure which one is the biggest challenge that we're facing right now. Uh, I think, you know, for us, we just want to be able to accelerate our progress as fast as possible. And that's what we're, we're going after um, to try to have the most the most impact. And what about funding all this? Has it been all grant funding or have you had any private investment yet? And, and what does the landscape look like for funding going forward? That's a great question. You know, we were, you know, previously funded on the academic side, both through a combination of NIH grants, the NSF, as well as the Beast Institute. Which really helped accelerate our progress while we were uh, within the uh, university setting. You know, since then we've been supported by a couple of areas, uh, including a, a J and J Quick Fire Challenge Award, um, and then most recently the Gates Foundation. Um, so we're really gracious for both the support um, that we've had, which has all been um, you know grant funding, and not a lot of support so far. Very nice. So I love the the, the answer to that challenge question that you're only looking at opportunities, and and I think with that mindset, opportunities come with milestones and being very driven towards reaching certain targets, Kyle. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, um, and it sounds like, you know, some of these milestones will be hopefully achieved pretty soon. One of them, I would imagine, again, I'm going back to that 510k approval, but what else are you striving for in the next, I guess, six to 18 months? Yeah, great question. I mean, we are, um, of course, looking, always looking for additional funding to accelerate progress across all these different indication areas. Uh, we'd, of course, love to go after every indication possible, but that's not 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 um, possible with, um, you know, limited funding. So certainly fundraising milestones are, are, are key. Um, you know, as we get closer uh, in completing all these studies, getting packages ready for FDA uh, submission for, you know, d- these different indications is, of course, going to be a big party for us. And then shortly after there is, uh, you know, planning for going first in human with different trials. So, you know, a lot of areas that are are actively ongoing, you know, as these new milestones are achieved, we'll be looking to expand the team. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, team is very important. There is no doubt about that. Uh, it takes a village, Richard. Uh, we know that. When it talking does indeed. To founders, right? Yeah. And we've had the pleasure of meeting one of your colleagues, David, uh, who came and presented at the Impact event and. I think you're a perfect jewel to to drive this company. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, what was the background between that original connection with you and David? Sure. Yes. So, um, yeah, you know, the backstory was around the time that we were having um, our, our first child back last November. Um, it was hard for me to uh, be in person for certain pitches. So in a number of years before David Wu, uh, a clinical cl- collaborator and I had uh, been working on some um, collabor- collaborative works for applying the materials and uh, some studies that were going on in the uh, dental space for oral surgery applications. And we started to work closer and closer together. And it was clear that, you know, this could be an opportunity not only to, you know, collaborate on on the research, but also some areas to help really translate the technology. So it's been really a pleasure to have gone to work with uh, David over the past few years, but also, you know, engaged on a closer level for ways that we can uh, further promote um, and accelerate translation of, of this technology. And when you think about building your team, do you have anyone in mind or that skill set or that particular expertise you would look for in terms of that next key hire? Or is it too early for that? Or what's the timeline when you think about taking that next person on in the team? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we're, of course, always looking for talented folks to, to help contribute uh, towards what we're doing. Uh, we made a number of uh, hires recently uh, to help support the program uh, development. You know, the next folks that will come on board, you know, could be a variety of roles, uh, you know, both technical as well as more on the, the business development front. And we have um, some interns right now that are fantastic that are supporting um, a number of efforts. Um, so if you're interested, you know, please feel free to definitely reach out. Um, we're always looking for uh, bringing on uh, talented folks to really support our our vision. Well, Kyle, like, again, I think that, you know, Ben oozes this calmness is the word I always think of with Ben, you know, you're just very level-headed in your approach and, but I'm sure as you look back, Kyle, we always talk about reflection and a lot learned in this process. Yeah. I mean, especially, you know, when you're, you're doing this every day, you kind of eat, sleep, live, breathe, you know, your work. Um, It's a part of your life and you've come, you know, this far and you've experienced a lot. And I think the audience is always kind of interest, you know, when you reflect back on these experiences, if you could kind of identify and pick, 
one, two, a couple uh, key takeaways, pieces of advice um, from those experiences, I guess, what would you say to the folks out there that maybe might be interested in, and also venturing off and developing their own medical technology? Well, you know, I think there's, you know, you don't have to do this alone. I think there's a lot of support within the ecosystem. I mean, we started off by going through uh, programs within the, you know, the Harvard Innovation Labs, uh, well before, you know, we were even exploring, you know, the formation of a of a, of a company, um, really just to start to think about converting our, you know, scientific deck into a, you know, more of a, a business pitch deck. And we had, you know, a lot of awesome champions there that, that supported us. And those kind of led to some next steps to other accelerator programs, you know, of course, leading up to the MTD2 impact accelerator, um, which was a, another fantastic opportunity for us to, you know, further pressure test our ideas and concepts with some awesome folks within the, the industry. So I think, you know, really jumping on these, these opportunities that exist within the medical device space um, that can further promote and mentor, you know, young emerging companies is, is great. Uh, iCore program, you know, was a fantastic way for us, particularly as a, you know, platform technology to really focus what we're doing, um, having folks that could really help us think about you know, how to ask the right questions, um, not just get folks excited about a technology, but really get a, you know, what are the unmet needs? How can the technology address those, those unmet needs? Um, it's, there's it, ways yeah. that you can get involved without getting the i grant. You can go through the, the node programs that are based in the Northeast and other parts of the country. Um, those are stepping stones to getting that, you know, that $50,000 grant from the NSF. And you know, we went to the, the MedTech Innovator program, which was another awesome opportunity where we were able to, you know, get on the final stage at the MedTech conference um, in 2022. So, you know, all these things present really exciting opportunities um, and they take time to um, build relationships with folks. So um, I think, you know, best advice to, to, to anybody thinking about this is is just just go for it. Uh, be strategic, network, value the the time that it may take to really establish those relationships, whether that be with other innovators or clinicians. You know, it, it takes time to to get to know folks and, and see where they can be most useful to really advance your work on, on some bits of advice. But, we're, you know, we're still going through it. You know, we don't, you know, we're, we're not FDA approved yet. We're, you know, still preclinical. Um, so there's a lot of work to, left, left to be done. So I, I definitely look forward to, um, you know, hopefully returning to this podcast once, um, you know, we are in humans, knock on wood, um, and being, uh, hitting all, you know, all sorts of new milestones and sharing our progress then. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely have you back when that happens. There's no doubt. Um, but I, what I really appreciate too, uh, and I know Richard and, and you and your team over there at M2D2 in the impact program at UMass Lowell and all the other, uh, ecosystems and organizations that you mentioned, uh, I'm sure they appreciate hearing that, but at the same time, I, I don't think it couldn't be, it couldn't be any more true. You know, I know myself, Although I'm not someone who's started a medical device company, I'm someone who participates in a number of these events and to see how the community is and how supportive all the folks are within the industry, um, it, it is really, truly special. And unless you put yourself out there and you actually go and attend firsthand, you just really don't know. Um, so, you know, I'm sure they all appreciate that. And that's great to hear. And you got to keep driving that home uh, with everyone out there, you know, the importance of of just letting others help, you know, and, and talking in, to other folks um, and getting advice and input on direction. So uh, fantastic to hear. I guess, too, you know, something that we're really curious about is what motivates you every day to do what you do? You know, I, 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 think, I think this is really, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity, uh, you know, if the clock is ticking with all these things, um, it takes a long time and it's a lot of work to translate technology. So you have to have a lot of grit. Um, you really have to have a lot of grit. You have to have that vision that, um, you know, what you're working on can, can uh, you know, get out there and be used by, by clinicians and patients and really uh, benefit, benefit care. So for us, it's not wanting to, you know, waste any opportunity to, to make that happen. Uh, that's, again, great advice. Uh, I think the mindset to me is the key term that keeps coming back again and again, that you have to have that methodical approach, but you also have to have this curiosity to learn as you keep going, because there's a lot of unknowns in this process and you do have to figure these things out and build the airplane as you fly. I wonder about the vision, because it seems like you have had a sort of natural evolution developing this research into a product. Uh, and I wondered if you took time to think about, you know, where you want it to be in five years time, in 10 years time, like where is this company going to be? What would that future vision look like? 
Yeah, I, I think that as this evolves, um, we'll start to hopefully have you know technologies that start to get approved, start to get used by clinicians. We'll start getting more feedback on new types of uh, form factors of these materials that we can start to develop. We can start to inter integrate other types of features into these materials. You know, I think we're trying to bridge the interface between tissues and technology to really make that impact to to transform healing. Um, that could just be you know the baseline materials that you know I think we're all familiar with that, that we've been sharing, but um, we start to think about novel delivery systems, integration of other medical devices with tissues, um, getting away from traditional methods of tissue, reinforcement and attachment that involve, um, you know, older methods like suturing and stapling, that that's really where we can start to really envision new ways that we can um, really harness the, the power of these, these materials. Great. I, I love the big vision. And, and again, I love the mimicry of what you're doing in terms of recreating natural science as they approach. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who are keen to learn more and get in touch with you. There's no doubt, Ben. How do people get a hold of you? If they want to, you know, get in touch, maybe throw you a few extra bucks to keep your, uh, to keep everything going on over there. Or if there's a really good, talented person out there who's just as passionate uh, in the wound care space, it sounds like, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. So how do people get in touch with you? You know, great way, you know, feel free to go to our website. There's a little link to um, sign up for our, our newsletter, um, as well as a way to, to contact us directly. So um, that's probably the best place to go. We have a page on LinkedIn that you can also visit to keep up to date with the latest and greatest from, from Lemax. So um, please do reach out if you're interested in um, getting involved further. That's right. And I'm sure you're on there too. So it wouldn't hurt to send you a connection request, uh, no doubt. So fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure those inboxes will be filling up. This is such an exciting space you're working in and, and huge unmet needs. So thank you again for coming on today, Ben. It's been an absolute pleasure to learn about the story and your mission and why you're doing this and you know what you hope to achieve going forward. Uh, excited to get you back on the show, of course, to hear more in another year's time. So thanks. Well, thanks again for, for having us and um, really hats off to you. Uh, Richard and, and uh, Kyle for organizing this awesome podcast um, and uh, running this really exciting program. So thank you again. Our pleasure for sure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, another huge thank you to Ben Friedman, co-founder of Lemax Biosciences. And thank you for everyone to tuning in for another episode of the MedTech Impact Podcast. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Beaglejohn. Until next time, keep innovating. Oh, <laughs> oh,